meeting law, we are conducting this meeting online to ensure public access to the discussions of the Boston Human Rights Commission. The public may have access to this call through telephone and video conferencing. So members of the public will have an opportunity to provide comments at the end of our meeting. Uh, so first I thought we would ask the commissioners to introduce themselves, your name and just a, a sentence or two, just a, maybe a minute. So uh, uh, let's see, why don't we judge, why don't we start with you? You have to unmute yourself. Great. I did, okay. I'm Judge Leslie Harris, retired judge of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I live in Roxbury in the Grove Hall section. Um, I'm a former number of things, teacher, um, public defender, prosecutor, and I believe in the rights of all people, and I believe those rights need to be protected. Thank you. Um, and Anne, Anne Russo. Hi, I'm Anne Russo. I live in Jamaica Plain with my wife, Nancy. I am Chief Financial Officer at Metro Housing Boston. I'm also a retired minister in the United Church of Christ. And I'm here because I believe in respecting the dignity of every human being. Leonard. Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan. Boston's been my life, all my life. Uh, currently, I'm the general manager and curator of uh, the Roxbury, I mean, Roxbury State State, Roxbury Heritage State Park, and Melania Cass uh, Recreational Complex, pro, former, former Division Director of Violence and Injury Prevention for the state, which includes suicide, sexual assault, domestic violence, uh, youth violence, motor vehicles, trafficking. Also former Deputy Commissioner of Public Health for the state of Connecticut. Uh, I'm here because I've born and raised Boston, experienced the worst and the best of Boston, and I truly believe that the best is yet to come under the leadership of our current mayor and the commissioners who are on board. We got a lot of work to do, but you know, will is half the battle and I feel there's a lot of will. So that's why I'm here, be part of that will. Great. Grace. Yes. Hey, you can hear me now. Reyes Colte yeah. Yechea. Uh, I am an immigrant, uh, American by choice. I've lived in Boston for 28 years. I've lived in this country most of my life. I am a professor at UMass Boston, and I am here uh, to act. Uh, often professors uh, read and write, sometimes, in, uh, in bad times, uh, we also act. Um, this is such a time. That's great. Thank you. I like that. Robert. Hi, my name is Robert McEachran. I'm a third generation Codman Square resident. Uh, I've spent over 30 years in community activism in the Codman Square community. Uh, and I've spent the last 20 years working with at-risk youth about the last 16 of which was with GLBT youth um, in a residential group home. I've taken all of my experiences to inform and ground a lot of my opinions and experiences, and I hope to bring that to the table to help uh, many voices be heard. I also have a learning disability, and I grew up in special ed um, in the Boston public school system. So I think it's very important different voices get to the table and be heard, and I'm very proud and honored to be a uh, part of this committee. Thank you. I think I have all the commissioners, I think, uh, and Evandro and uh, Susan, why don't you introduce yourselves? Sure, uh, I'm Evandro Cavallo. Obviously, you know, I'm the executive director of the Boston Human Rights Commission. I am uh, excited. It's, it's it, you know, I'm super excited to finally get to this day and looking forward to a productive discussion, uh, you know, finally to have all of the Commission is in one place. I can't tell you how excited I am. So I'm looking forward to the to the amazing work that we all going to do for the city of Boston and all of us that live here. So I'll pass it to Susan, who's the, our new executive assistant. Uh, 
Well, hello everyone. I'm Susan. I'm the executive assistant. I am a recent law school graduate. I just graduated from New England Law. Um, I'm an immigrant from Greece. I'm also half Egyptian. I'm very into human rights, so I'm so happy to be part of the team. And just like Evandro, I cannot be more excited. Okay, I think I missed one commissioner. Ben Goldberg? Yes, yes, you did. Ben, Ben. Hi, Ben Goldberger here. Uh, I've been in Boston since I graduated law school in 2002. I live in Jamaica Plain now with uh, my wife, my two daughters, and um, two cats, one of whom apparently is printing something, so I apologize for that noise. Um, uh, I have uh, spent the bulk of my career in public service uh, and I'm currently the general counsel of the executive office of energy and environmental affairs for the state. I'm here because Boston uh, certainly was with this commission when it was founded, was a national leader, was a national leader in a number of areas. And uh, I think that this is a really important vital area where we continue to lead and I'm honored to be part of that. Thank you, thank you all of you. So I'm Margaret McKenna and uh, most people uh, who would know me would think of me as an educator because that's what I've done for most of my time in Boston. But I started my career as a civil rights lawyer uh, and trying cases around the country, uh, mostly on race discrimination. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, unimaginably painful for me to watch over the last months some of the cities that I worked in suing police and fire departments actually uh, some of them uh, watch what has transpired uh, you know we thought things would change uh, many years ago and things change but remain the same uh, the systematic systemic racism that exists. Uh, and, and I do believe things would change, otherwise I wouldn't be here. And uh, as I heard, I wouldn't be here and act, because I think this can be action. The other thing is, believe it or not, I was the executive director of the Association of All the Official Human Rights Ag Agencies in the country, meaning the city and state agencies. If people aren't old enough to remember Glendora Putnam, when she headed MCAD, but those were during those years before I became uh, uh, rehabilitated as an educator, I guess. <clears throat> but one of the things I never left uh, was my commitment to access and social justice. And so I'm gl so glad to be back uh, uh, it, having this as a centerpiece of my life because it's always been a big part of my life. And I'm grateful uh, to the mayor for particularly for his putting this at the center of his policy agenda your policy agenda mr mayor and for calling it a public health issue it's uh, long overdue and i hope that boston becomes a model for others as we have in so many other ways so i turn it over to you mr mayor Can you hear me now? Yeah. I've been on calls all day watching people talk to the screen. And I'm like, how come they can't get it right? And I just did the same thing. Um, let me just, first of all, thank you, um, Madam Chair, and thank you, all the members of the commission, the commissioners, thank you very much. Um, as I look at the, 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 the picture of the commissioners, uh, it really, it's, it's, it already tells an amazing story. And I want to thank you uh, for, your, for, for what you bring to the table. Uh, whether it's activism or, or, or education or um, your, your, your legal legal knowledge, um, it, all, all the different pieces, community activism. I've known Bob for a long time. I met Bob when I was a young state representative, and, and he was a young activist up in uh, Ashmont Hill. Um, and, and you know, and it's great to see all, all all of our lives come full circle here. So thank you. Uh, I just want to take a minute to talk a little bit about the history of the. Boston Human Rights Commission. Um, it has a long and interesting history. Uh, it started under Mayor Ray Flynn. Uh, it was created uh, as a safety net, uh, as protections for the most vulnerable people in Boston's community at the time. It helped the city put its moral weight behind some of the important issues, especially the LGBTQ right, uh, rights and rights. Um, and th those rights were not recognized at that point. The first executive director was a gentleman named Frederick Mandel, an openly gay man. Uh, at the time when our city and our country was changing, 
a great deal. The commission helped ensure that nobody fell through the cracks and everybody had a place to turn for help. In the 90s, uh, the commission became inactive. It stayed that way until we reactivated it last fall. Um, the decision was made, it was clear, we needed to use every resource available to protect residents and residents' rights. Uh, in the last few years, we've seen re resurgence of human rights violations happening in America. Um, children being torn from their parents <clears throat> and imprisoned in unsanitary camps. We saw those images on TV. Asylum seekers being turned away without a hearing. Uh, it's a violation of international law. Uh, workers being threatened with firing because of their gender identity or sexual orientation. Uh, women's reproductive health care is, is, is all but banned in, in most states. Constant threats of striking terror into the hearts of immigrant families, causing them to live uh, their lives in the shadows. Um, according to the Human Rights Watch, uh, which monitors human rights violations across the globe, the United States is moving backwards. Um, the United States should be a beacon for human rights. There's no question about it. Uh, we must do everything in our power to uphold those values here in the city of Boston. Uh, this is the central responsibility of the Human Rights Commission. <coughs> um, I was proud to appoint Avandra Cavallo as the Executive Director uh, of the newly activated Human Rights Commission. Uh, Avandro uh, was a state representative in Boston, representing an incredibly diverse community. Uh, he was an assistant district attorney who understands the importance of law as it means to serving victims and protecting communities. Uh, he's an immigrant uh, who came to Boston from Cabo Verde at the age of 15 years old. Um, you know, a graduate of Boston Public Schools. Um, Avandro graduated from Boston, Madison Park High School, went on to earn his degree from UMass Amherst and Howard University School of Law. Uh, and, and also, the, the, as, you, as you can see, people watching and hearing, um, the seven appointed commissioners um, are a diverse group of Bostonians uh, with a range of diverse backgrounds. Um, so it's really important as we move forward here. Um, the importance of this commission at this moment, even from when we reactivated it last fall, uh, the COVID pandemic has shined a, a very big light on the inequities in our society. Uh, we continue to, to, to have conversations around police brutality and racial violence all across our country. Um, and that's added more urgency to our work. In, in 2020 alone, we've learned some important lessons about the disparities that persist in Boston. Uh, testing and access to healthcare. This isn't necessarily with COVID. This is just people's lack of access to healthcare. Uh, food access, we've served over almost 2 million meals, uh, whether it's through our school children or families through the COVID crisis. Uh, language barriers, gaps in internet access, housing insecurity. Uh, and we've been working uh, around the clock, quite honestly, on a lot of these issues and close the gaps that exist. Uh, the Human Rights Commission has been an important part of this work uh, and it's going to continue to play an important role as we continue to move forward here. Uh, and I think that that's really important. Um, the commission, and, and I, I know you know this, but must continue to focus on the rights of immigrants, in my opinion. Um, we have this battle every day. No, we don't have a battle here, but we have this conversation every day. It's also important for the commission at this moment in time to focus on racial justice. And it was as important yesterday but there's been a, a lot of conversations. There's an ongoing movement for radical justice uh, and racial justice, I should say, excuse me, um, and, and emphasize, is emphasizing the urgency of the work that you're all gonna be doing here. Um, it shows that we have still a long way to go as a nation and as a city to protect residents from hatred, bigotry, and violence. We're hearing stories every day, um, not just in other parts of the country, but right here in our own city and our own state. Um, the commission hopefully will continue to focus on access to information. Uh, the COVID pandemic has highlighted several disparities in our society, including internet access. Uh, this has major implications uh, for kids and their education, workers in our economy, families, access to public health, uh, and information regarding all of those spaces, public safety information. In Boston, we certainly believe that fair access to information is a basic human right. Uh, and I'd like to ask uh, all of us to make sure that this issue is something that you work and explore. Um, last week, I, I announced uh, the first ever equity cabinet in the city of Boston, the history, which brings exist existing departments, including the Office of Resilience and Racial Equity, Diversity, Language and Communication Access, Women's Rights, Immigration Rights, uh, Immigrant Rights, and Human Rights Commission. 
Uh, this work will be led by Dr. Carolyn Crockett, a longtime activist and leader and educator here in the city of Boston. I think Carolyn might be on the call. Um, and, and it really, the Human Rights Commission was, it was housed indirectly in the mayor's office. Uh, and, and now it has a permanent home uh, with a real budget and moving forward. I know Evandro and myself have had many conversations around uh, making sure that uh, we fund this office to the point where you can actually do some real good work here in the city. Uh, I also announced that we're moving 20% of the police overtime budget into physical and mental health programs and safety and well-being of our young people and the long-term success of our neighbors. That includes $2 million in new funding for community-based programs of support, uh, including violence intervention grants, youth programming, language and food access, immigrant advancement, and the Age Strong Commission, and the Human Rights Commission. Uh, so that money is gonna be, be put into those departments. Um, now it's, I think, as you said, Margaret, now it's time for us to show what Boston and what we really stand for. Uh, now it's time to use every, every tool at our disposal to protect our residents. Uh, this is an opportunity to do some real good uh, work here and set a national goal, a national uh, precedent. And I think that we have a unique opportunity here. So I just want to say thank you all uh, for being here today. Thank you for being willing to serve. Uh, there's a lot of chat going on in the chat room. Um, Carolyn Crockett is on there, our new chief. Uh, John Barros, chief of uh, economic development. Uh, Joyce Lenihan, chief of policy. Marty Martinez, uh, chief of health and human services. City Councilor Anissa Sabi George. Uh, Yusufi Valley, uh, the head of our, our um, immigrant advancement, Willa Nuha, who uh, works in fair housing. So many people on the chat that are here that are interested in the work you're doing. So I'm going to stop talking there and I'm going to turn it back over to you, Madam Chair, because I know your agenda is full and you didn't come to hear me rambling on. Uh, so you came here to hear you guys. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, uh, you know, I think one of the reasons that the commissioners are here, uh, the is because of you in the in the commitment you have and and because of some of these people you import, you uh, have appointed Joyce and John Barrows and uh, Marty Martinez uh, all of us are anxious to work with because we know that all of them join us in this same effort uh, and I'm anxious to meet Carolyn uh, and talk with her uh, and we're thrilled that she's there. Uh, and one of the things we want to make sure of is that we're not duplicating what other people are doing with the, the COVID uh, task force at work and the things they've found. We want to learn from them. I, Evandro has been sitting in on those meetings, but there's so much work to do. We don't, we don't want to duplicate what other people are doing, uh, whether it's uh, women's advancement or the immigrant advancement. You have a great director in that immigrant office. He's phenomenal. I've talked to him and I said, you know, we're so lucky to have you here. So we want, I think Invandro is in, the, is in the perfect place to do that. We want to make sure we know everything that's going on and we don't want to duplicate those efforts uh, or the efforts that Wayne Budd is doing or Lee Pelton is doing. I mean, we want to know what's going on and we want to make sure that we can support the other efforts that are going on, uh, but not duplicate them because it's enough to do that we don't have to all be working on the same issues except to support them. Um, Evandro, do you want to uh, make some remarks here? I'll be brief. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, you know, I had, in fact, uh, written a whole a PowerPoint presentation, if you will, uh, for today. But I, you know, at some point I decided that this is uh, not about me, uh, not about my day, but it's about our day. Uh, you know, I want to start first and foremost well, thanking the mayor, uh, Mayor Walsh, a friend of mine, a uh, colleague, uh, for his leadership in the city as a whole, and particularly in the area of human rights. Uh, you know, when he called me last summer, he began to talk about this, uh, you know, it, it sparked something in me. Uh, as you all know, I had uh, been uh, on, uh, the, I was a state rep for quite some time, for a little while, and then uh, wanted to be a law enforcer, essentially, right? I wanted to figure out other ways to continue to serve the people of the city of Boston. And when he presented this, yeah, I couldn't say no. It's one of those things where when you look at the ability to affect people's lives in the city of Boston, the idea that we all are equal, we all should have equal access to resources, uh, to services, to benefits, uh, for me to be in a position to effect that sort of change, 
uh, speaks volumes to what, who I am as an individual. Uh, so again, I wanna give the mayor kudos, not only again for this, for this uh, commission, but as someone who's working government, I've seen leadership uh, both at the state level and now here to see what he's been able to do over the past several months, uh, taking us as a city through COVID-19 has been unbelievable. So keep up the work, good work, my friend. Uh, I also wanna thank all the people on your team. The fa you mentioned all of them, so I, I won't go through, through mentioning all the chiefs and the heads of departments that are here. City Councilor, I see An uh, Anissa here. It speaks volumes, again, the people that are present in this first meeting as we start uh, to the amount of work and to the priority uh, and to the importance of this work, okay? Um, so I also wanna thank, I wanna take the time to thank uh, the chairs, uh, the chair and the commissioners. All of you come from different parts of Boston, bring so much to the table. I've learned, I met all of you individually uh, and, and learned so much about you and what you bring and I'm excited to see the work that we're gonna to do together. Finally, I wanna thank uh, Susan who just came on board two months ago and hit the ground running and it's been very helpful. So I can only, as, as, as someone who went to law school, I'm very excited to have her on board to take us to the next steps. Um, you know, again, I, I had prepared remarks, but at the end of the day, you know, what the mayor said is exactly what I wanted to say, which is, that the importance of this commission, of his history about, and the focus that he's had in the past, the ability to stay current with events, uh, particularly what's going on in the world right now, whether we're talking about uh, Trump and his administration and what they're doing in, 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 uh, against immigrants, or uh, unfortunately, the, the vast amount of uh, killings of, of, of too many, too many men and, and women that look like me. So to me, to be in this position to potentially affect change uh, to, to benefit the city of Boston and the people of the city of Boston. It's a great honor, it's a great privilege, and I'm not taking it very lightly. Uh, I want you to know that at the outset, uh, since I started, I've been pushing very hard for this day, and I'm very excited for the work that we all gonna do together. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, I'm sure I left someone that I wanna thank, but essentially, I'm, I'm super, super, super excited to get started. I can't wait to hear from the commissioners and their ideas and how we can continue to support and uplift the people of Boston that need it most. So thank you, uh, Margaret. Thank you. Um, I, 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 I wanna say that uh, also, I think the timing is, is, is so important. If there is anybody left who does not think we have a problem here in Boston or in this country, then they must have their eyes and ears closed. I have to say, I I've, I've, you know, was on the Boston School Committee at one point, and I've worked closely with BPS, and I, I was surprised to find that when Boston Public Schools went remote, there was a percentage, about 10,000 households, who did not have access to the internet. That does not mean they, they did not buy into the internet. It means that they could not buy into the internet. I, this is 2020 and people could not access the internet. This is not only true in Boston, it's true around the country. And I think, I think it's one of the things that was on the mayor's agenda. It's certainly been on my agenda after I heard that, that kids were sitting in the back of a car so they could access the internet that was you know, attached to somewhere else. Uh, and in these parts of town that have no internet, they don't, even, they don't have a Starbucks either. Uh, those are the parts of town that don't have the internet. I think it's embarrassing for the providers that there are parts of town uh, that don't, they have literally uh, uh, excised from this opportunity. And it's true not just from education because uh, a lot of education now will be remote learning. But it's true in terms of healthcare. I'm on the board of Beth Israel Leahy Health. And one of the things we've learned is that telemedicine has changed medicine. And when you think about underserved populations in medicine, you can think about now you don't have to take transportation 
to see a doctor. You don't have to find your way to a doctor. You can now do it online, which is one, you don't need a babysitter. Two, you don't need transportation. You don't have to have a car. And three, it is much cheaper. So the insurance people and the doctors and the hospitals are figuring out what you have to pay and how you pay it. And that, besides education, healthcare is also going to benefit from access to the internet in underserved populations, plus a lot of other ways, I mean, in terms of information. Uh, so I, the mayor put this on our agenda, and, and I think it's something that we need to look at uh, for sure. And uh, immigrant rights is one of the things he talked about, and we will be working closely with the Immigrant Advancement Office. I'm sure they have a lot of suggestions for us, uh, as does the COVID uh, uh, task force. Uh, and racial justice, you know, is something, it, the reason we're all here. And if, if people don't believe that there is an issue with racial justice today, then they never will. Um, so I, I'd like to open uh, the discussion up of uh, our mission. Now, the original Human Rights Commission had a more traditional mission in that it received complaints uh, from individuals and it investigated those complaints. To be honest, it uh, only of 120 individuals who filed complaints, a very small portion of them were uh, investigated and resolved. Uh, and I, I, I have thought about this a lot and looked at other cities and other places. I would hope we could discuss something quite different. And when I was a civil rights lawyer at the Justice Department, we looked for things that were a pattern and practice. In other words, if, if, if the city of Boston has parts of Boston that don't have internet, and they happen to be parts of Boston where a lot of black and brown people live, where uh, a lot of poor people live, that's a pattern and a practice. And it's something we should look at. Uh, so, and if, if we found, as I found, that, um, you know, people were afraid to go to certain food banks, uh, why were they? They were immigrants who were afraid to go to food banks because they were afraid that, uh, that they would be intercepted by the police who would then, uh, uh, then report them to ICE. So there are issues to deal with, and they are a pattern and a practice. What I think we owe everyone in Boston is if they have an individual complaint, I think our responsibility is to ensure that they know where to go for that particular complaint. If it's housing or it's employment discrimination, they can employment discrimination, they can go to the Mass Commission Against Discrimination. And I think our job is to ensure that they know where to go, that they get good service, and if they don't, they come back to us and that we're there to support them. But I would hope that our role is a broader one that has broader impact than just one individual, but that we could spend our time solving important issues that affect and impact a broad range of individuals, like the impact having access for everyone in Boston to the internet. So I, I'd, I'd like to hear your responses to what you think we should be doing and what it would look like. Well, I would like to just make a, a brief comment. I, I think uh, some of the things that we should look at, the HRC should look at, just the disproportionately how black men have been, uh, and black boys have been marginalized since for the past 400 years. And, and how it really hasn't come to the forefront of looking at it in a way where we can talk about how do we help and, and not to minimize the black community or black women or others, but looking at 
how systematically over the past couple hundred years, there's been a focused attack on black males um, from mass incarceration, education, homicides. Uh, and of course we wanted, because I'm a public health person, I look at surveillance and data all the time. And of course we look at the disproportionate risk factors that come into play with men of color. I don't think there's enough echoing of the importance of uh, reporting, uh, deep traumatizing, and uplift of uh, black males and uh, black men in America, specifically even in our, in our town. I think there should be some much more focused effort on that so we can start the healing process uh, so everyone would get a benefit from that. And that's black women, that's um, black children, that's communities, and people in general. I think uh, there's been a less focus on that and more focus on the general aspect of racism versus what's currently been happening for the past um, couple hundred years. So I'd I, like to. Yeah, I wanna go on, but I, at some point I wanna come back to that because I think you're, I would agree with you absolutely right. And, but also at some point we wanna go back, we're gonna make a list here, but go back and think about, we'll put this on the list, but it, have a further discussion, whether it's this meeting, or next meeting, or whatever, is, is uh, what that means, right? I think you're right, but what does it mean? Uh, what, what would we do? What, what, what would we, uh, or help others to do? Mm -hmm. So, yes. Yes, um, you know, the main feeder for the juvenile court was the Boston Public Schools. And 90% of those kids that came in front of me were black and brown children. Yeah. And they were there for childhood behavior, which in my mind was not criminal most of the time. And I think we need to look at the pattern of not just the Boston Public Schools, but the private schools, the charter schools, and how they over criminalize our children. Because it really bothered me then. Most of those cases never went any place, but yet they have it on their records. And we need to work with the Boston Public Schools to stop this. The second thing, I live in Roxbury, the Grove Falls section, and I have Amazon. I do not get the same service as someone who lives in JP. And that is not just here, I'm from Chicago. The same thing is true in Chicago if you live in a black community. We don't get one day service. It's not possible. And I think those are the little things, those subtle things that they do to our community that demean us and make our community less than other communities. So those are some of the things that I would like for us to address this year. Yes, on my part, um, in addition to uh, raising awareness and uh, monitoring compliance, I think if I interpret our, the documents well, we have the power to, uh, to hold hearings, public hearings, and also to issue reports. Um, one of the issues I would like to flag is uh, concerned uh, by immigrant groups that Boston Police at times is sharing information with federal agencies regarding immigration status. Um, so I would like to suggest that we hold uh, uh, an open meeting or a hearing uh, on issues of immigration. I would like to flag that particular issue, but it's not the only one. Okay. Who else? Uh, one thing I think as a commissioner I'm interested in is consistently looking at structural issues uh, where institutional practices have clearly um, gone awry or gone in an area that, of concern. And I think that can happen at a multitude of levels and affect lots of different populations. But a lot of the underlying issues are the same. 
and it has to do with access to power, communication, and accountability. And how as a commission can we start giving some public light to some of that accountability and be part of the conversation? Because oftentimes uh, I feel that a lot of groups don't have uh, ability, even when they're pointed in certain directions, but they need a, a public forum to uh, help shine the light on some of these issues and also raise consciousness about them. So that's my, my view of it. So transparency and, and uh, access to information that's easily accessible as opposed to taking a lot of time and uh, not only time, but uh, ability to, to find it. Sometimes it's there, but it's hard to find. That's but also I, think, I also think there's a meaningful role uh, to ask the questions where yeah. sometimes uh, I think there can be a hierarchical or institutional response that checks all the boxes, but misses the underlying current of when people have feelings, it's for a reason. And you know, if someone feels like they're wronged in a situation, we can point out the situation, checked all the boxes and follow the complaint chart. But if the chart itself is fundamentally flawed, it's hard to, it's hard to raise that uh, if there's not a neutral open form. So I think that's something that the Human Rights Commission could really rise to the challenge and really empower the city to help some, some tough lessons to be learned and some communication about those issues. Right, right. Okay. I do think um, uh, the, the report writing and the public hearing function that you mentioned is, um, I think a really important one because I, I also was struggling. You look at the way that this that the ordinance is drafted, and it's very much like MCAT. And at the time of its founding, the commission really had, I think, a big value add because there were categories of people who were being discriminated against who couldn't go to MCAT. Right. But MCAT right. is sort of caught up with us, if right. you will. They, maybe right. not exactly. But um, when I think about what is the, with all of the different entities that are working at these problems from different angles, you know, what is the unique thing that we can do? What is the, the value that we can bring to the table? Um, I would agree with the chair that uh, I, I don't know that processing a bunch of one-off complaints really adds value. I don't know if we can decline complaints that come in from, from citizens, uh, but I, I'm not sure that we should really be encouraging the use of the commission on those one-off things and instead focusing more on the systemic things and more on uh, you know, the impacts on neighborhoods um, that, uh, that, that correlate with impacts on protected groups. I, uh, but I do wonder if that, that is best done through kind of a report writing, public hearing type function, or through the complaint process, but through complaints that we ourselves initiate investigations for, because they're complaints about real structural systemic problems, not one-off, you know, this particular landlord and this particular tenant. So in the Civil Rights Division, the Justice Department, we would sort of do exactly what you're talking about, analyze, think about what are the big issues, and then, and in what part of the country were they most problematic? And then we would go investigate and find people who were having those problems. So it was the reverse of someone coming to complain you would think about exactly what you're saying is you'd think about uh, uh, there are people who were referred to ICE and uh, by the p police. So we've heard that that's a problem. So you'd go find people of families and if that's a problem, you would go f investigate that issue and then find the people who represent that issue. If you were uh, thinking about schools uh, in terms of the BPS problem with school to jail and, and um, 
uh, how, you know, also how black and brown kids are treated in terms of discipline. I just have to tell you one story. When I was on the Mass Commission, Massachusetts Board of Elementary and Secondary Ed, one of the charter schools came and I was looking through their materials and I said, is, is this correct? 40% of four-year-olds had been suspended. Four-year-olds. I was like, as a four-year-old, what do you have to do to be suspended? I mean, and where do you go? What do you do? And if 40% of four-year-olds were suspended, you know, so that, and the race issue in terms of discipline in schools uh, is significant. Now, that is something that the, uh, that the state has taken on, uh, and it has improved but it's still an issue. And it's an issue in the charter schools as well that are very discipline based. So, uh, and, and, but I, I have always been concerned about the suspensions, uh, the significant number of suspensions, because that's one indication of, of uh, differential treatment as well. All right, who have we not heard from? Uh, we've got a lot. If we can fix all of these, we'll be we'll be good. You know, I'll, I'll, pitch in, uh, I'll pitch in briefly. I think you all hit it on the nail because really there are so many different things we could be doing. And as as Commissioner uh, or I, my good friend Ben said, uh, is back in the '80s when they created there was a gap, right, uh, in terms of particularly with gay rights. Uh, now, a lot of that, particularly in our state, is sort of covered. I think I, I, think, I, I believe the MCAD has more protected classes, as we say, uh, in constitutional mm -hmm. law than we do. I think they recently, or, or the past few years, and I think I might have even been on Beacon Hill at that point where they had uh, pregnant, being pregnant, right, as, as, as one of the protected classes. So I think two things I want to leave with that. One is, is for us to as we discuss priorities to sort of figure out, and uh, Margaret McKenna mentioned this earlier, is, is to figure out what is the lane that we can take and be impactful, right? Because there are, particularly as of late, uh, uh, after COVID, with the funds that have been, uh, been started through the city, uh, with the departments that we're going to be working with, there's a lot of work being done in a lot of these spaces. So I think what we have to think about as we go forward, one is narrow our focus, at least as we get off the gate. Two is, is, is figure out that lane though, where we can add value, right? We can be a partner to, to immigrant advancement or to women advancement or, or, you know, so those, I think that's to me over the, over the months has been sort of what's been nerve wracking is that I think our lane, there's, there's too many lanes, so way we choose the lane and secondly, we can envision the the work of the commission going forward in the sense that we can make recommendation obviously to the mayor and the city council to how to modify it to get it to where we are now right if if if, if the parameters of the law uh, the ordinance as was written in 1984 and i think it was amended in 2002 uh, do not sit well with us is where do we go right because the law is, is as often said, is a live document, right? So we have to reflect the needs of the society and the communities that we serve now. So uh, I guess that's my only piece is, is, is the lane. And I've, been, I've talked to many of you and I see a lot of the, the folks that, that have been uh, participating, uh, whether the heads of the department, Yusuf, certainly I talked to them about this. Uh, Joyce Lenahan, I see her. Uh, there's so many people that I've sort of say, okay, where is this lane that we can go and be impactful? Because we don't want to duplicate uh, a lot of the work that city departments, nonprofits, and, and other agencies, including MCAD, the EOC, are doing on a daily basis. Because uh, I, I think we can be more impactful if we can find that lane. Now, that lane, I, I guess, is where we, we need to get to. What is it? So I haven't spoken yet. Um, oh, yes, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, um, I agree certainly with what everyone has said. I think now also is a time where <clears throat> I don't want to forget that violence is on the rise against transgender people, especially people of color. Yes. And that the the fastest 
growing population of people going to jail and prison is women. And so I don't want to forget that either. And I think with, with the heightened awareness of racism comes more racist actions. So I feel like we should also sort of be watchful of what happens in our city and what's going on because I have I have seen an increase in racist comments on Facebook and out there. And I think that um, we, we should look for patents, we should do all those things, but I think this is gonna be an emerging issue for the city of Boston. I don't, I think it, it shows the best of the city, but I also unfortunately think it shows the worst of the city. So I just want us to sort of be watchful of what's going on to be the eyes of when human rights are being violated in the city. Can I make a quick comment? Yes, of course. Uh, I was just thinking that, you know, since the HRC has been commissioned um, from the past administration, there's a credibility issue that we have to deal with. Uh, everyone knows, and I talk to a lot of people, a lot of community activists, and everybody knows um, it's the flavor of the month right now. Racism is like the buzzword, even though people have been impacted by it 24 seven. And so therefore the blessing of COVID-19 let people sit back and see how ugly this world has been. Uh, I think we have to be careful because as we step out of the gate, we're coming from a negative and not a positive because people are, uh, may look at us as just a rubber stamp, uh, just a, a blurb in the paper, or somewhere it goes and nothing ever happens. Mm. And I'm not saying that we have to be everything to everyone, but we have to be, our integrity is very, very important, especially coming out of the gate. And I think we need to be real careful and, and real strategic of how we make that happen. Um, um, versus if it's going for a black man, transgender, uh, schools, courts, whatever. We have to be real strategic of how that message is played. There are a lot of people, thousands and thousands of people are dealing with microaggressions in the workplace, in housing, uh, in their in corporate environments, uh, in schools uh, that are going to come and depend on us for some type of leadership. And that's a lot, a whole bunch. So I just say to all of my fellow commissioners, as we get on this journey, how important it is for us to make sure our integrity is the number one thing people see of how we deliver anything that of, of the millions of things that we're gonna have to be before us. Because people are looking, and as someone said to me, oh, oh, Lenny, I hear you on the HRC. Oh, so that's gonna be another rubber stamp for the mayor, huh? And I said, people who know me, know that that's not who I am uh, uh, and, and, and my integrity uh, to my community and to the city is one that I cherish like my life. I say that to all of us as we go out because we're coming from a place of negatives trying to make it positive because of you know the, the HRC has not been in it's been inactive for so long. So I just want to encourage folks in and around that and just think about that as we as we step out. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I sort of asked the question, same question before I agreed. And as somebody said to me, do you think the mayor would have asked you whose middle name is Troublemaker? <laughs> uh, I'm Troublemaker too. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, if, uh, if this was gonna be a rubber stamp, would he have asked you? And I, well, you've got a good point there. So, you know, this uh, commission is full of troublemakers. So I don't think that, uh, uh, and, but I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, you know, it can be just another group, right? one more group uh, that that sort of plasters over decades hundreds of years of the problem uh, and black lives matter this issue matters and it can't be just one more group because uh, then we, none of us want to be part of it right so we've got to pick uh, intelligently we can't be everything to everybody at the same time uh and and we've got to do it well uh and with integrity 
Um, so, I mean, I, I, to pick up one thing, I'm, I think we can do an agreement with MCAD to, to make sure they, you know, that we we're in agreement with them about handling complaints so that we're not, we're not just ignoring them, individual complaints. But then I think all the things we've heard just now, I mean, yeah, any, any one of them uh, would be, every single one of them that you all mentioned, I think all of us would agree with all of them. Uh, you know, so one of the questions I have is, how, how do we get to that one or two things that we need to do. And one of the things I had put on the agenda and asked in my email to you is, is who should we be listening to besides ourselves? And should we, should we individually or as a commission ask people to come to talk to us? And if we did, who are those people or who are those organizations? I mean, we're, we're among ourselves and we represent a lot of different constituencies uh, as is, and, and a, a lot of us, a number of years, uh, decades as well. But do, you know, are there, what do you think? Do you think we should bring people in? Do you think we individually should go out? Should we ask, for con what do you think we should do here about hearing from others? Uh, I think I think we should have some type of open process to bring in uh, community leadership to talk. And, and and believe me, I'm I'm opening up a can of worms when I say this because I know what it's like. I invite folk in, and I know the folks who want to sit and and talk about, you know, the water burst on the street, and he called me. Uh, he didn't like the size of my shoes. I don't know, <laughs> but I think it becomes really important to that. Uh, one, be transparent to the community at hand and make it of some sort of way of making us available. Uh, and I'm not saying available where we have to have hearings and all this other stuff. I don't know what it looks like, but I think that helps build and let people know that we're serious about it. Even though when you have those things, people expect change to happen like that. They expect something to happen when oh, I met with them, they're going to turn the whole place around and this will never happen again. Uh, uh, clearly understanding that it can become a bridge for us, for the, the many people that we know in this space, but also uh, bringing in folks who we don't know. And one thing I've realized in, in this work uh, ever since I was a kid is that when you start hearing the same thing, somebody's right. And the only way you can hear the same thing is you're, if you're out there. So, that's just a, 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 a slight suggestion, I, I would say, that we have to get out there some way. And it's good that we don't put it all in involved. We, we put it amongst ourselves. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that would be a good idea. I, uh, I fu fully, fully agree. Um, I think that there are some bodies that are important that we communicate with. Uh, one of them would be city council. City Council in, tw in 2011, I think, proclaimed Boston as a, a human rights city, one of the few human rights cities in the United States. Uh, so I think we have some uh, connection there that we can, uh, that we can use. I think um, bringing in leadership of important organizations, uh, would be helpful to talk to us and it would be equally helpful for us to do site visits or maybe we can go into or some of us can go into a place when that is possible um, a physical place and listen to people who are not leaders uh, but are affected by uh, the conditions that we have built in our societies. I, I agree. I think um, if we weren't in the time of COVID, there might still be a way to do this is to have community meetings and ask the community what issues they see going on in each community and then 
then maybe a pattern would reveal itself about what we should really be looking at. Yeah. Well, in this way, you know, we could at least invite them in. It's not perfect, that's for sure, but we can hear other voices. I think one of the things people have learned uh, is, you know, don't project what you think people are thinking or want. Uh, you know, I learned that in philanthropy is that a lot of philanthropists assume they know what people need <laughs> without asking people in a community what they want or need. That's why, you know, some philanthropy is wasted because philanthropy is run by a, a sort of elite group of white people. And so the, the, there are a lot of assumptions made. Um, so uh, I do think it's important to hear voices. Now we shouldn't spend the next year listening to voices. I really think we should be an action oriented as I've heard you say. So we ought to figure out, you know, how to do this. And we can do this to hear voices and voices can be in writing as well as they can right. be orally, we have to hear them. And we can invite people, you know, in a number of ways to tell us what they think the major issues are and what we can be doing about them. We have hearing power, we have subpoena power, we, you know, we can, and, and uh, we can issue reports. Uh, so, and we can, uh, you know, get the support of the mayor on issues. Uh, and uh, I definitely think the city council was about to do something like this uh, and when this was created. So I do think some, some uh, uh, discussion with the city council or the head of the city, president of the city council uh, uh, is important to do. So do people agree with that, that we should invite people to, to do that either in writing or we should invite at least a few people to come in and talk to us? Yes. Anybody, yeah, go ahead. If that makes sense to me. Uh, I know obviously it would be great if we could go out in the various communities and hit people personally, but uh, COVID-19 unfortunately is here and we don't know what's gonna happen next. So we, we should definitely focus on how can we work with what we got. Which is, which is work through Zoom primarily uh, um, to get some, some feedback around some of the issues that we, that we focused, that we already mentioned, and listen to people about their own issues and send, so we can try to figure out how do we narrow things down. I did see, I do wanna see, uh, I do see that some people put their hands up, some put their hands up and went down. Uh, we are going to have a public sort of session comments in a little bit, so, uh, the, the, uh, I just want to be uh, let people know that in case they missed the agenda in the beginning. So in a few, in a little while, we're going to have uh, people raise their hands, and of course, you can ask questions, you can uh, make comments, and such. All right. So just for the attendees. To, to, yeah, Anne, did you want to say something or? Yes. Yeah, so I think we have to also be careful about not leaving people out if we're going to do this remotely. Mm -hmm. If if there are people that don't have access to the internet in the city of Boston. Oh, okay. I mean, we, we want to make sure that we include everyone, that we have different means of people to be able to reach people, that's all. So that is very difficult. One of the problems we want to solve is internet access. So we're going to communicate to people by internet. Right. Uh, so I, just, I just, sorry to cut in. I just want to add, um, from my point of view, it is very important that we look at, as we create systems for communication, both with the greater community and as we do our work going forward, I think we should be cognizant about not just the barriers of technology, but also linguistically uh, and, and uh, issues of access of disability. Some, of, some, some ways in which I know technology can help, uh, but sometimes as we're, we're just talking about the internet access piece, that's, that's another barrier to challenge. And if we're, I think we should be making sure that we're opening to both diverse voices and sometimes voices that can't be heard. Uh, and I think there's ways that can be done, but I think it's important as we start looking at going forward, how we make that more structural for our point of view, both if it's translators, adaption of technology, but making sure that 
sometimes the voices aren't heard for a reason and, and it's the people in power's fault. And since we're in that position now, I think it's, we should be very cognizant of that. Yeah, I think we should, and, and, uh, and Susan and Andro, I, we ought to see what the city council is doing and the school committee, what are they doing? I mean, they certainly have these issues. And uh, I know they're doing, um, I know that they've looked at these issues and found solutions. So we, ought to, we don't have to invent the wheel here. Let's figure out what other people are doing who have public meetings, uh, because I, I agree with you. We, 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 can't, we can't reinforce now the bad things that we're trying to fix. So exactly. we ought to be a model, not a mirror of uh, what we're trying to do here. Near the group I've been working with, and we've been having similar problems and issues. And one of the things that we did was, we purchased about six different laptop computers with internet access. And what we call these are drop, we call them, we call them drop computers. Well, we would drop them at a nonprofit that didn't have access and with a hotspot if they didn't have access to the internet. And then they could hop on to a Zoom call yeah. at that particular site. Uh, and then also had translators in some places. I mean, it, if you have a little resources, there are some very innovative, greater ways to make this happen because it's not unique to us. A lot of people have already basically uh, uh, put some pretty interesting things together to give access to those who haven't had access prior. Yeah. Well, the Boston Public School dropped about, I think it was 153 hotspots to reach kids that didn't have access uh, in the spring. So that's a temporary solution, however. Uh, so I guess what I would suggest is that that the commissioners send to uh, Susan and Ivandro uh, anybody you think we should talk to our organizations that we should talk to or invite in and uh, Let's see if we can make some sense out of that. And I would suggest sooner rather than later, let's listen to people, but then let's decide to move forward on something. Um, one of the things I would like to do, if you agree, is this issue of internet. No one really has the exact data, but um, I've been doing, as Evandro knows, been doing some research is there are a number of national organizations that have some data and there's one national organization uh the internet uh, uh is how it affects structure and this this uh organization has a tool uh that you can use in your own city and so uh, we did that. We being my son did that. The royal we is not me. It's my son, uh, who is an extraordinary uh, techie technologist. And um, he just needs a little more information, maybe from the city, and we could produce a map. Mike, you want to put up the map that you got already to show? Can you do that? Give me one half this is my son, Michael, who doesn't, doesn't work for the city or anybody. <laughs> Works for his mother. See, so this is the kind of map that we're talking about. And uh, it will show you, and you'll see, there are places where there is very high, uh, very good access to the internet. Right next to it, there's like none. And uh, I don't want you to totally rely on this because it's not done right, Mike. It's, uh, it's pretty accurate, but it's not as finished as, as I would like. Uh, but you, you will see it's, it's weird because you'll see something where there's almost 100% uh, access next to a place where there's less than 7% access. So that there's a story there. There's a story there. 
And there are also a story about people who have, uh, you know, low, low, uh, slow, I should say, internet, as opposed to, you know, fast internet. So we'd like, I think we would like, uh, be helpful to have data that we can really rely on uh, to make this case and then to see what we can do about it. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure what the right answer is, but the only way you can get the right answer is to have the right data. I'm a, I'm a real f a f a believer in having the right data. So uh, uh, I'm suggesting that we put my son to work <laughs> But his mother's to say in his mother's good graces. That's all. That's what he gets paid. Um, so, but it's fascinating just to look at what we have so far. So, okay. Thanks, Mike. So, uh, so people move on to move on. So, if you would send Evandro or uh, Susan your list of names or uh, organizations that you should, and, and after we have the list, I will share it with all of you, with the commissioners, and we will prioritize it, and we will ask people either to come personally or to send in a written response in terms of suggestions, uh, and then I, what I would do is uh, I would like to meet in uh, in July, if we can do that, um, in a couple of weeks, uh, because I've, we waited a long time to get this going, and I'd like to really move at a pace, if we could, if people agree with that, uh, to really see if we can uh, work on some of the issues that you raised this evening. People want to comment on those suggestions. Does that seem reasonable that we you send in the send in the information and then we share it and uh, see if we can uh, figure out who to listen to and can they write it now? We have to figure out. Evandro, I'm going to leave it with you. We have a lot of lawyers on this in terms of open meeting laws, how we do all of this, but you'll figure it out and make sure we do it correctly. Yes, we'll figure it out. Okay, <laughs> we want to make sure we comply. Um, okay, so other comments, we're going to go to public comments, but I want to make sure the commissioners uh, have a, a chance to make comments. Anybody else? So is this going to be by invitation only, or are we going to make uh, additional efforts for outreach? Because I, I, I do think that it's important to make those efforts, and I want to echo what Rob said about language access. Um, I, I'm sure the city has a language access policy or plan, but um, I think particularly for the sort of work that we're doing, we uh, may want to go above and beyond what uh, the ordinary thing is there so that we can make sure that um, we just make every community aware of what it is that we're doing so that they have the opportunity to, to weigh in if, if uh, if they so choose. Well, all the meetings have public comment opportunities, uh, but it is a question about how people find out about it and the access to the internet, right? So uh, we need, we probably need some help with that um, because I'm sure other people have faced this problem in terms of the city council and the school committee. So maybe, Evandro, you could talk to some of them and I will. they've thought through that issue. I just, I do want to add that language access is, is one of the important departments that is being invested in the city, particularly as you've probably seen some of the literature that came out through COVID-19, several different languages. Right. So uh, that's one of the pieces that we're trying to put together to make sure that all different languages are being heard. Uh, perhaps, though, what we could do uh, in some shape or form, whether it's a press conference, uh, uh, not press conference, a press release, whether it's, it's a message uh, on our website that we're going to work on, uh, find a way to say to people, say, send us your comments, right? In, 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 well, again, it could be many different methods. 
so that folks know that right now we're listening, we want to hear from them, whether they come into Zoom and, and, and log in right now or later, but they send me an email, they call. So I think we just put out something that we find a way to get the message out there that we're up and running, we want to hear from people, you know, now sort of thing. I think that's one way to also remedy some, as we start getting, uh, obviously we're gonna hopefully meet in the next couple of weeks or so. So I think that's might be a way to kind of get ahead of it now. I want to make sure we reach out to young people. Yeah. And to those folks who work with our young community. Um, I see in the audience there is uh, Jennifer Vivang uh, Wong, who is a, a former student of mine and works for the city of Boston in an office that is exactly for language access. I'm, I'm sure oh, she's oh. very, very interested. Okay. Uh, and I think several people from that office are, in fact, attending this meeting. And of course, if anything comes in Spanish, you can give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, uh, uh, briefly, uh, I think we need to do like a, I don't know, kickoff, but really talk about, uh, as we put our name out there, what is our mission? What is our goals and objectives? So people clearly understand why we're here even if we don't know why we're here. <laughs> but we have to put something out there basically stating that, you know, why we're here. And your voice is important, and we want to make sure it's heard. Right. Uh, I think we, we, we got to be more public because of the past, uh, you know, we've been dormant for such a very long time, and we don't want to seem like we're reacting to the current trend right now, Black Lives Matter, racism, all that stuff. No, we're reacting to what we should have, what we always, why this thing was created to react to wrongdoings to all people. So I just, I'm just thinking, how can we kick something off, talk about our mission, talk about maybe some goals and objectives briefly uh, so people can understand why we're here. Yeah, I agree. So maybe we, one of the things we ought to do is, uh, is, uh, think about a press release after this first meeting um, or sometime that it, talk about our work and, and talk about uh, some of the things we're, we're looking at. And, and one of the things we're doing is we want to open up here from community and communities mm -hmm. about their most pressing issues. Makes sense. And give them a way to, to reach us. Through mail, through the internet, through a, a, a telephone number. Um, so we ought to think about how to do that. And we have a couple of people on the chat who have said they would like to talk to us so we can follow up with some of them. So the commission, do you have anything else? We'll, we'll move to the um, public comment. Is that all right? Okay. So Susan, you've been watching. So we do have a couple of people that raised their hand, like Yesenia. So I'm going to allow Yesenia to talk. Yesenia, just so you know, you have two minutes. Um, I will give you a minute when it's 30 seconds left. I am not the bad guy here. If I cut you <laughs> off, I'm so sorry. Um, here is Yesenia. Hi, thank you so much. Um, for having me. Um, and I, I feel like um, everyone has brought up all the issues that everyone has brought up. I work in the medical field. I work in the city of Boston and we deal with these issues on a daily basis. Um, and, and just not being able to communicate because of language barriers or um, what I see in my community, I'm born and raised in Boston. I'm from Roxbury, Dorchester. I'm from all over Boston. Um, I just see that we don't know where to go. We don't know who to talk to. We, um, I speak for a lot of people in my community, for the young kids, for the older people. We do feel sometimes shunned out. Um, and we feel like, you know, how can we be heard if we don't know if anybody's listening or if they don't understand us in our language? Um, one of the biggest concerns I have my father is a, an inmate at Norfolk facility. And uh, one of the questions that I'm interested in knowing is 
what aid, if any, is being provided to inmates with pre-existing conditions who are not being transported to the proper medical facilities to address their medical ailments beyond the infirmary with the jails. Um, and, you know, the re that, that pertains to our communities because black and brown communities have always been targeted, our men, um, with the policing and being brought into jail and things of that nature. You and so people seconds. like my dad, people like my dad who have pre-existing conditions are not currently getting the proper medical medication and attention that they need. How can we address that? Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? I know people uh, have comments. I don't know. We do have Haroon. Haroon, you have two minutes. Is he still here or? Um, he should be. Haroon, are you there? And folks, please uh, raise your hands too if, if you are. This is the time to raise your hands. <laughs> I know some of you did earlier, but this is the time. So we can, uh, you know, maybe Haroon will be back. Haroon, okay, we're gonna I, have- I actually see him there, so, but I'm not sure what's going on, it says. It so says he's on, Haroon, okay. are you there? So let's go to Will, I see Will, is that, who's next? Will? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Well, good evening to Evandro. Good evening, commissioners. This is a this is a pleasure. By the way, my name is Will Onoha. I am the executive director of the Office of Fair Housing and Equity, and I'm so happy to see the Human Rights Commission actually come to fruition. Myself and Evandro have had lots of conversations about it, and um, <clears throat> really, and what I'm what I have to say is that we we actually are twin agencies. In fact, we are we are different sides of the same coin. The only difference is that where we are limited is where you can go much further. To answer one of your questions, as far as MCAD goes, you guys have all the protected classes that they have. It's a state thing. So Boston is covered under that. That's one. Two, we would love to meet with you guys and share some of our processes with you because I think we can definitely help you in a lot of the ways. We do the same exact thing that you guys have all been talking about for the last few minutes as far as processing. We, we do the same exact thing. So we would love to uh, meet with you at a time that's convenient for you where we can talk with your commissioners. In fact, invite our commissioners to meet with your commissioners so we can have this discussion. But what I really want to say more importantly than anything else is that you guys have to understand you are charged with an immense responsibility. Your ordinance is the single, in my opinion, most powerful ordinance in the entire city of Boston. You have the power to call anybody to order. And with all the things that, in fact, I echo all the comments all the commissioners have said, but I particularly echo the comments of Commissioner- You have 30 seconds. Got it. Commissioner Blakely, because I think it's really important for this uh, commission to, I mean, you don't want to feel like you're drinking from a fire hose. I know it's going to feel that way at first. So because I probably have 10 seconds left, let me just say that we're glad to have you guys and we would love to continue this discussion with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Okay, we're going to try Haroon again. Haroon? I don't think so. Is there anybody else, Susan? Um... If not, we'll move on. We do have Jennifer. Hi, good, uh, good evening. Um, my name is Jennifer. Hi, Professor um, Reyes, Commissioner. Um, I just wanted to jump in and briefly say, um, so I am the Learning and Development Coordinator for um, the Mayor's Office of Language and Communications Access. And I know that myself and our team would love to you know talk further with you all to figure out how to integrate language access within like your future meetings um that was just my brief comment and of course it's an honor to be able to um input um this information here thank you so much thank you and i know anista isabe george was here uh city councilor but she has signed off she had another commitment so we do have another one. Let's 
should be R red, you are up next. Should be able to unmute yourself. Can I be heard? Yes, you are. Okay, good evening. I'd like to uh, uh, say uh, uh, congratulate everybody for this uh, occasion. This is a, a great uh, forum, I think, that uh, uh, is here. Uh, I'd just like to say a little bit, uh, I'm a lifelong resident of Roxbury, uh, former school teacher, uh, and I think that You disappeared. Did we lose him? Did we lose him? Yeah. Okay. Mr. Uh, Mr. Red, are you there? Did you just get down? Yeah, why something. Uh, okay, so I guess hopefully you'll come back on. All right, is there anyone else? Um, I do not see anyone else. If anybody else would like to uh, have a comment or a question, please raise your hand or type it into the chat. We will oh. wait two minutes for phone call, phone <laughs> call in listeners. I think that's all for now, unless okay. Mr. Red comes back. All right, thanks, Susan. You're welcome. Um, so next steps. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, Ms. <laughs> Chairwoman McKenna. We have Yusefi Valley. Should be able to unmute yourself. Ah. Hello, Chair, uh, Madam Chair McKenna, um, uh, Director Evandro, and uh, all the commissioners. I just wanna congratulate you on launching this uh, uh, the the commission and, and the meeting and I, I just want, uh, really looking forward to working in tandem with you all and uh, just wanted to say that you know as as I've been listening to the conversation uh, just a thought I've, I've had is that there is a lot of fear among our immigrant community and I, I do think the Human Rights Commission with the name human rights in it uh, I, I just wonder if it has a, diff, a particular kind of resonance to our immigrant communities and therefore makes you more accessible than any other part of city government. And so as you're thinking about your priorities and next steps, just, just want you to keep that in mind that you may be uniquely positioned um, in a way that no other city agency would be. Um, so I, I don't know exactly what that means in terms of future because I totally appreciate the systematic approach that, that you wanna uh, want, want as opposed to the individual approach, but but something to certainly factor in as you're you're um, thinking through uh, your your priorities. So thank I, you so I, much. I I tend to agree with you because human rights is something all over the world that's understood, where as opposed to civil rights, which have a different connotation in different parts of the world. Uh, but human rights is recognizable, I think, uh, and more recognizable to immigrants, uh, more approachable. I think that's right. And we are looking forward to working with you, uh, for sure, since the mayor put that first on his agenda. So we're definitely looking forward to working with you. Um, and, and for instance, we'd love to know what you would put on our agenda. <clears throat> you know, what do you think the two or three things, I don't have to answer now, but I mean, that's one of the things we would like. You've been working in this field and with this community in Boston for a while now. And one of the things we'd love to hear is, you know, if, if what, what, are the, what are the two or three things that we should be looking at, researching, investigating, talking to people about 
uh, writing a report on doing, you know, what, what are the two or three things that are most important? And one of the things I think we should think about, I think that there are possibilities of bringing in, you know, students from colleges, whether they are law students or students who are in master's programs doing some research, a little more complicated these days because we don't know where students are be, going to be doing what. <clears throat> but I think it's possible to get some other help um, because that's what we're going to be looking at is research uh, as opposed to traditional uh, investigators, uh, data and, and some research. So, um, but, but we definitely like to hear from the uh, immigrant office to see what you think should be on our agenda. Yeah, so, I'd, love, I'd love to come back. I'd love yeah, to come back on absolutely. that. Absolutely. We'd love to have you back. Love to have you back. Uh, just so, uh, just to add on to what you were saying, Margaret, there has been several schools, uh, some of which are local schools that reached out to me over the months, including, uh, including UMass Boston, Northeastern, uh, Harvard. Uh, in fact, my, my law school, Howard Law in D.C., reached out. So I think we, we, we should be able to have uh, interns, fellows, uh, you know, uh, certainly law students and policy students are helping us out as yeah. we move forward. Yeah, I had a few too. BU, the folks there reached out to me. And right, BU, are, uh, BU reached out too. In fact, I know some right. folks at BU as well. Right. Okay, so next steps, uh, we're going to, uh, each of us think about who or what organizations we ought to hear from besides the immigration office, the immigrant office not the immigration office, the immigrant office. And um, we're going to, how often do you think our meetings should be? Once a month? Does that sound right? Or, or what do you think? I think once a month is uh, good. I also was looking at the, uh, the archives that Evandro sent us, and uh, the previous commission was meeting uh, twice a month, which wouldn't be bad if we are uh, making progress on certain issues. Certainly, uh, this is the most important assignment for me, um, aside of my classes. Okay. I think, I think initially we maybe maybe we should we should have twice a month. Uh, along with uh, Sister Reyes just said, I think it it becomes important because there's a lot of stuff happening right now, and for us not to be there to wait another thirty days to even hear it, it could be an injustice for us in our work. Okay. And I agree with Leonard, and would add that eventually we might have committees. Right. Yeah. So the you know, every other meeting could be the, the committee meetings, and I'm ready. Okay, I I agree. Actually, I think that we ought to meet more regularly, at least at first. I agree. So I'm glad I'm glad you think so as well. All right. So we will uh, send out uh, two dates in July uh, and two dates in August. Uh, and I'll expect to hear from you. Uh, I have no idea what day it is. What day is it? It's Wednesday, Tuesday? 30th. Today's Tuesday, the 30th. <laughs> Every day seems the same. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Wednesday. It's Tuesday. Uh, so if we could get your information by the end of the week uh, in terms of people and organizations that we should hear from or reach out to, that would be great. And we will send you some dates for July. A couple of dates for July. Okay. Is there anything else? I see yes. something. That, yeah. Like, Jasenia has a has a has a question. I believe Yesenia um, was the one who asked about her father, who's an inmate. She yeah. would like an answer to her question about resources for him and other inmates. Should um, we'll have Yesenia, if you don't mind, I'll have you pop right back in. Oh. Mm. Well, 
Well, Yesenia, are you there? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So um, I was just looking for <clears throat> to see if there was an answer to the question. So the question is, um, what aid, if any, is being provided to inmates with pre-existing conditions who are not being transported to the proper medical facilities to address their medical ailments beyond the infirmary with the, within the jails? So let me, let me suggest it. State prison or federal prison? He's in a, um, is, is that? Um, MCI. Uh, yes, MCI Norfolk. <laughs> So it's a state prison, right? That's a state prison. Yes, I state believe prison. so. So all I can say is, that can we try to find the right person uh, in the state system where uh, at least try, try to find the right person in the system for her to talk to? If she can leave her, uh, her email address, we'll definitely follow up. Okay. With with, uh, with some with some resources to follow up on. Yeah. Thank you so much, Yesenia. All right. I think that's it. All right. Well, I I uh, I want to thank Ivandro and Susan. I want to thank all the commissioners for your attention and uh, comments and. Uh, your intellectual wealth here that you provided and uh, conversation and I uh, look forward to working with you. Appreciate your giving us your time uh, and your commitment and I'm energized by hearing from you. Uh, I did, some of you I've seen before at places uh, but I really didn't know folks well and i'm really glad to meet all of you and i'm very glad uh to join all of you in this effort so ivandra you wanted to say something as well. yes uh, as we close uh, obviously we'll have to in the future we'll worry about training in, in public records and, and and all those things but one of the things we have to do as we close the meeting we have to do a motion to uh to adjourn in in, in second and such the procedures uh, some of the things that we have to obviously pay attention to as we go forward. Obviously, this is the first time, but uh, I suggest that one of the. Uh, I'd, I'd like to make. I would like to make a motion to. Uh, I second it. Close second. out this meeting. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed. Aye. All right. The motion is carried. All right. Thank the meeting you. is adjourned. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Good time, guys. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Be safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I guess we should come out. <laughs> Let's see, end. I just see you, Robert. You're the only one. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs>